Okay, welcome. So uh, tonight is about guided automation. It's about uh, automated machine learning. And, uh, and it's also about this tool that used to do this uh, workflow here. So just a question, how many of you heard before of NIME? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, and I guess how many of you use NIME currently to do data science? All right, so not as many. Uh, I would like to, to talk to you about uh, automated machine learning and how to do all of this, but first I need to give you a few insight about the tool they have been using. And when we do data science at NIME, we build a workflow. So this is how it looks like. This is a really simple example. And this simple example is to train a random forest model. And we, what, this is a bit different from, I don't know, some R script or a Jupyter notebook with Python, right? Like you can see exactly what is going on by reading those uh, blocks that we call nodes. You go from uh, left to right and you can read the sequence of operations being going on here. So it's, it's quite uh, transparent and you can see how you can join uh, in this case to data color uh, to data sources and then here we filter some columns we do some conversion from number to string we partition the data uh, um, a part of the data is used to train a random forest the other part is using to make new prediction and then we save those predictions and we also visualize the results so all of this it's uh, it's also easier to present if you're continuously developing new data science project and continuously need to present your results to someone, this is easier to share, right? And to make it even easier, you can in IME use those annotations. Okay, say this part is for this task, the load of the data, this other part is for the data transformation and so on, and then we here we do our analysis and here is where we display our results. So this is uh, um, how we do things at NIME, and, and the thing is that, uh, again, it's uh, an example that it shows you that it's all pre-configured, right? Uh, to set things in this workflow, you need to double click on those nodes, and to add new nodes, you need to drag and drop them. But when someone wants to change something, he needs to install the tool and go through the settings. And uh, we can make this even more accessible. How do we do this? Well, first we need to create components. So the same section I showed you before, now they are closed in those, uh, uh, on a bigger scale nodes, but we call them components. And inside those components, you can still find the other nodes. But the thing is that you can now expose certain parameters of the process this way. Meaning that each of those components will create interactive view an interactive view that you can use to actually uh, operate with, uh, I don't know, in this case, upload a different data source, uh, filter the data, and visualize some results. And I have a download button here. It's a really simple deploy option. All right, so in NIME, you can always go back, see the nodes inside each component, and you can also open the interactive view. Right? You can access the component interactive view and, uh, and then you, you can use it. And this tool is all free to download. You can just go ahead and use it. So um, I think that I would like to talk about how I use this system to automate machine learning is actually to make all of this remotely accessible. <coughs> so what does this mean? You, take, uh, you create such a workflow, then you uh, post it on, uh, you, you move it on a uh, server, right? And when you move it on NIME server, then you can also access it with, via NIME web portal. That is from any web browser. So anyone can log in and access those interactive pages I showed you before. So again, it's the same thing. You have a workflow, then you uh, right click on it, and then you open it on the web portal. And this is how it looks like. Just that now this is just a uh, your web browser could be Safari, Internet Explorer, anything, and you have those nice next and back buttons to go through the applications. Okay, so now we know everything we need to know real fast about uh, how to, to develop such a thing that we call guided analytics application, right? And when you use guided analytics for uh, automate machine learning, we create uh, something like this. And, and the question is then, uh, okay, what is all this AutoML? How many people heard about AutoML before tonight? Like, just raise your hand to understand, right? So the idea of AutoML, for the ones of you that did not uh, 
heard it before, it's the idea that automatically we can create machine learning models on the fly. So the, the point is to not have a data scientist that is uh, manually deciding each step. Right, And uh, so how do you do all this automation? Well, for example, for the part of loading the data, that is uh, maybe one of the easier part once it's known where the data is coming from, right? So whether you're using a certain kind of uh, databases, you can automate the composition of SQL queries. When instead you have, uh, for example, uh, to blend different data sources, also you can automate this. Or for example, making REST calls to uh, get data uh, directly from REST services, right? But um, okay, once we do that, there is something a bit more complex that is uh, uh, a big part of the machine learning process that is the pre preparing the data in the right way for the model and also in a useful way, right? So this is instead about the part where we clean and transform the data. And there is so much we can do here to actually automatically prepare it for our models. So, the first thing we can do is, uh, is about feature selection, right? To find the best set of features or feature construction where we create new features from already existing ones or simply some data cleaning, right? So what are this kind of uh, uh, preparation? Well, data cleaning is basically just missing volume only, or for example, we can compute some statistics, right? Compute how many constant values are in a column and take some action based on that. To automate things, you just need to uh, think smarter automatically what a human would do, and then you can put it in the system, right? So for example, we can compute the correlation and take action when the correlation is way too high. Or outlier detection, if it is requested by the user, we can also do that. But um, regarding feature engineering instead, is uh, something where you actually apply mathematical formulas on all those features, or you take all those uh, different features and you combine them together, uh, hoping that the model will find something in this uh, uh, highly nonlinear uh, feature space that was created. For example, we can also uh, create uh, with dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA and, ex and, uh, and operate all those information, uh, all, all those, uh, create all those new features. But something interesting about uh, this part that now you have so many features, you created just a, a vast amount of features and you want to find the best set for them, right? So also this can be automated by, for example, taking strategies like forward feature selection and backward feature elimination, genetic algorithm, all of this can be automated. And we are going to talk about the optimization problem later on, all the different strategies you can take there. So let's talk exactly about the parameter optimization part, the model selection. So let's give, uh, uh, first of all, a more simpler uh, approach that is uh, how to find the best uh, combination of hyperparameters. Well, a, a really simple approach is then to, for example, this is a random forest model, and then we want to try many set of hyperparameters, right? So uh, we, we take this model and we are going to uh, learn uh, on the on the data and we're going to automatically repeat this for many model parameters. To avoid overfitting, we're going to use cross-validation, right? And at the end, you tried all those different models. So you have lots of different per performances and you want to select only a single uh, random forest model with the best performance and that is the, the, the set of hyperparameters that you want to select. But then, of course, this is just random forest. Sometimes it's enough to just take a pick a single model and automatically train it. But other times, you want to instead work with many different models. Of course, in this case, we're talking about supervised machine learning, right? So we have uh, uh, neural networks, uh, support vector machines, naive bias, and so on. And the approach is similar, just that now we need to repeat it for all those different models, right? So we uh, train for each kind, we uh, start training them. And remember that each of them will require a really uh, precise kind of uh, feature transformation. For example, the neural network just take numerical features, so you need to uh, already prepare all this, uh, um, all this encoding of categorical features. So again, you... Uh, train many uh, different models with a different set of hyperparameters, and you finally select only one per model, 
and in the end you just have a single, uh, in this case, model, that is the model selection, that the model that had the best performance. And in this case, again, we go back to the random forest model. Okay, so if you want to know exactly how to do this in NIME, there is this uh, URL here that you can use and you will find many information how to automatically uh, use NIME to, uh, in a, in a, with those parameter, uh, parameter optimization loops to automatically train all those different combinations. All right, so the, the first idea of how you automate this, right? How do you find the best uh, combination of hyperparameters? That, well, if you have lots of combinational powers, you can always try the brute force approach. Now, the brute force approach, there are some many different variations. You can have, for example, a grid search. In a grid search, for example, you, you just sample the parameter space and you move along. And of course, some, it, a lot of time, the direction will be uh, wasted because you are going somewhere where the performance is just not improving or some early stopping or, for example, random uh, search. This is depends, of course, on the computational power you have, variable, uh, you have uh, available or, and also um, on uh, uh, how, how much, uh, how, how hard is the, this problem that you're trying to solve. But in another case, you can always use uh, transfer learning, right? So transfer learning is the idea that you have a model that was already trained, for example, to solve uh, an image classification task. And uh, instead of uh, starting over, you're going to take this model and you're going to use it to, uh, to take those, uh, all this uh, trained uh, network, for example, and reuse it for another classification task. Then there is something that is uh, a bit more complex that is called Bayesian optimization. And the idea is that we are going to uh, predict and then learn from the parameter space. So each time we're going to take uh, um, some information regarding the last, for example, set of hyperparameters that we tried. And based on this information, decide whether to what uh, uh, combination of hyperparameters should try next. And um, this is a bit more tricky because there is uh, some uh, Bayesian theory in it, but uh, it, it is showing better, way better performance than the simple brute force approach. Anyway, uh, okay, we can go ahead and this approach using Bayesian or grid search, uh, computing some statistics, we can automate everything. But what I want to talk to you right now, it's not about how it's crazy that now you can easily automate everything, but it's, it's about something else. It's about the fact that it's important to always use the domain knowledge, the domain expertise of the human when it's needed. To always have a way to make the right question to the uh, data scientist uh, behind uh, this uh, use case, or even the, the uh, business uh, user, right? So the point is that at each step of this automated uh, process, we can ask the right question to the user. We can ask, do you want to provide some uh, uh, data set, another Excel file to be uploaded? Do you want to use this other database? And we want to have an easy way to do this. We want to give, in, in, few, uh, uh, in few hours, we want to have a way to develop a tool uh, that is making the right questions and they can always be changed and tested without having tons of developers to develop such a thing, right? So that is the, the point of uh, uh, doing guided automation, right? And it's also uh, used talking about augmenting automation with human intelligence. So not just AutoML, but something <laughs> some people start calling AugML, right? So always make sure that you can uh, not take um, taking away completely the human expertise, but always add it only when it's necessary, right? So how does this work? So you have an in-house expert that builds this workflow. And when building this workflow, you can then decide what is uh, not necessary to expose to the user. So the boring parts, they can be automated. And then you can also add interactions in, instead where are needed, right? And once an in-house expert can easily do this, then a business user can interact with the analytical application, can then go and easily, uh, should be a way that is easy to access, and at the same time, it should also be uh, hiding all those boring pieces and highlighting what's really important for the user, right? 
Um, so um, the point is then how much interaction, right? We can just have many, many pages making lots of questions or just using the minimum amount of interaction needed. So uh, th this is a solution we came up with at Nine. It's a blueprint. And, you, and it's something to start with when automated machine learning. And when I created this with my uh, colleagues, we came up with all those interaction points. Uh, and we are going to show you uh, live how this works. But the point is that some parts are also automated. So it's this balance between interaction points and automation. And uh, let's see a bit more how this works then. You have uh, this blueprint workflow that is the taken by the in-house expert of the company and is changing a few things and customizing it to the need of the company. Then it can take this uh, workflow and deploy it on the, on the NIME server. And then any business user can uh, re uh, remotely access it from, this, uh, from a domain, right? It just types in a domain from any web browser and then it can interact with it and train machine learning models on the fly. So, you can see here it's a mixed approach because we are not just providing a solution that by itself is ready to just train machine learning models. We have something where you can always have a data scientist to customize things. And let me show you more about how this works. So for example, let's go in the first part where we have the initial steps of the automated process. So here you have a initial part where you upload the data set and so we just said make a view to ask the user to upload the data or to uh, point it to the uh, right database it could be, right? Then you have a, a page where we select the target where we are going to ask what do you want to predict? In this case it could be then a regression or classification task. And then we have uh, a part where we can automatically compute all this feature quality, right? So you can always go inside a meta node in IME and see what's inside. So in this case, we open this workflow and we can find that we are computing certain statistics here. We are computing how many values are different in each column. And for example, uh, how many values are constant in a column, or how many missing values and so on. We take all these statistics and we combine it together. And already this provided to the user afterwards in the next step. As you can see here, we have different nodes. Those are visualization nodes. We call them now widget. And, and then here you can see in a view the same statistics, just that provided in another way, they can be much more useful, right? And I'm going to show you exactly how all the CSS, the flowchart the top, the, the sidebar on the side where we are going to inform the user on how to perform this task. Okay, so something else that is important when creating such an application is also to easily make some parts um, optionals, right? Because sometimes you might have a user that he wants to provide more input to the process and sometimes this user is just not able to provide such, such information. So here, for example, you can have a checkbox and this checkbox is saying, do you also want to fine tune the model parameters? And if this is selected, then the top branch will be activated and then we are showing then uh, more information on how you want to do feature engineering or how you want to do uh, parameter uh, optimization. All right, so now I would like to show you how this uh, works live and what I'm going to do is to actually go on, on my uh, web browser and gun. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, I'm in full screen, but this is just Google Chrome and I logged in and now this uh, is the workflow that is available on uh, Amazon Web Service Instance, could also be installed on Azure Google Cloud Compute or on premises in your company if you want to use it. So uh, you can just go ahead and, and start the process and should start at any moment. Okay, so this is the first part, right? Here we, we, we are asked to simply upload the data, but again, you can also add more options here. For example, to connect to Amazon S3 bucket and take some data from there. So uh, I'm going to select here just some data they have on my desktop, and now it's a, it's a small sample just for this demo. So, uh, and then I, I go and I hit next, right? So by hitting next, I go to the next page, and the first question we make is what do you want to predict? So we here it's just classification. It could have been also regression, but we also uh, we we are going to use this data set. How many of you know the adult data set? Can you raise your hand? It's a 
perfectly okay. So the adult data set is about having all those different subjects for which you know the work class, the education, the marital status, the capital gain, lots of census data basically. And for each of those uh, 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 subjects, we want to predict whether they make more or less than 50k per year, right? So uh, that's why we want to select as target income. And so we just select in a drop down and we go to the next step. All right, now we, that's the page I was telling you about. That it's an important moment where we decide what feature we want to use for our model. So you can scroll, for example, here and you see that only the top quality features are selected. And this uh, column relevance is nothing else than just taking into account those three tests and taking the maximum and reversing it. So for example, if we take all of them and we scroll to the bottom, we see that there is census here that is 100% constant. So this means that if we go here in the data preview, we will see that uh, always there will be always census year 1994 that is always constant because it's always been this year. So that's something easily that anyone can understand if provided with a view and can easily filter, right? So the row ID, for example, that's something that we want to automatically tell when there is a column that is always different. That should not be used by the model, right? So in this case, we can just move this range slider a bit to the side and uh, this uh, model will not use the top features or they're gone. But sometimes automatically using this uh, range slider, we cannot uh, spot all the columns that should not be used by the model. Sometimes, for example, you have something called um, ground truth leakage in the input of the feature column. So that is something that you want to have a user to go through the columns and make sure that it makes sense to use all of them. So for example, here, if I go into the uh, nominal one and I type in here, income, I can find that there is this column that is called gender with income. And gender with income means that we have a column that is uh, basically just using the income inside and we don't want to use it. So the user can just select exclude column here and this way the model won't be using this uh, feature, right? Okay, so now we can go and hit next. So the point is that we can now select all the models that we want to train. We could select all of them and wait a long time. I'm just going to select those four. So you can see there are some models that are more simple. And the models that are more simple are usually also easier to interpret. So models that like naive bias, logistic regression decision tree are not such a, uh, complicated ones. But So you should go for simple models when you can but also pick complex models um, instead when you, when you think that your task is uh, uh, not uh, something that uh, a logistic regression could learn because it's not too linear, right? So um, in this case, I'm going to just select those four and you see that there is those two additional pages. We, I'm going to show you them by just going to find two model parameters. And so I select it and I hit next. So, here you have all those uh, range sliders, and that's only for each model to decide the, how big will be the parameter search. So in the case of a data scientist can decide whether we want to test all decision tree between 8 and 20 minimum number of records. If we go for the random forest, maybe it's a bit easier. It's about you training many models, right? Many trees. So uh, you can then decide whether you want to train uh, or test random forest between 85 and 100 T's or, uh, or less. Or for example, the deep learning, it's a multi-layer perception network, so we can decide how many hidden layers to test, how many neurons and uh, number of neurons per layers and so on. Um, in this case, I'm, I just want to show you the settings also of the feature engineering part. Here is where we create all those uh, features, right? So, uh, for example, simple transformations is just applying the logarithmic scale or the exponential function to the columns and uh, to create new features. Dimensional reduction in this case is uh, creating a, a PCA, right? But all of this can be customized by opening workflow and deciding something else. 
cluster distance transformation, we take all the instances and we perform clustering and for each of the instances we are going to uh, replace the, the create a feature that is the distance to that cluster, right? Um, and then feature combination is just a random picking of features and computing the sum be between the feature, the uh, division and so on, and then we can select and see if this is improving the model or not. And that's exactly it. There is this bar where you can actually decide how many things you want to test. So if you put, pick one, uh, also you can, the data scientists can decide this. We're going to test something like 100, uh, 1,000 features. That's, we do not have the time for that. So that is 1,000 feature sets to be tested. And for now, we, we, uh, I'm going to just show you some predefined settings uh, so the training is fast, so we can always go back. For example, we are a business user that doesn't know any of these uh, complex things about those models, so he might just want to uh, use some default settings. So we go here, we, we are back at this stage, we select to not fine tune the model parameters. So when I'm now hitting next, we are just, you can see that we bypass those really hard views and we can go back directly to the execution settings. So in this case, they, of course, some uh, settings were predefined, like how big is the grid search then? This is can, it's all our coded now, that it was decided by the data scientists who deployed this workflow. So um, the execution settings now it's an important part because especially if you picked a lot of uh, 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 IP parameters and feature sets to be uh, set, uh, you might want to use Spark if possible. So uh, we also provide Spark uh, nodes for with which you can perform, uh, uh, for example, train those uh, um, models with a library that use parallelization. All right, so um, let me just uh, in next, and at this point we're training all those models. So if you do not care about the workflow, the execution, you just go on LinkedIn, take your mail, drink some coffee, or whatever, right? But in this case, since we, we have seen the workflow, we can go in IME and see actually that it's executing. So this is the instance. You can see now that this, uh, um, the, the job that is running here, and now we are accessing it. And you can see that this, the training validation of models is now executing down here. And uh, we can go and see that it's right now computing the feature selection. Uh, it was done just a bit of grid search. We can always inspect the data in a, in between in a, in a connection. So uh, in this case, uh, um, you, you can go here and see how many parameters were tested and gone. Okay, so it's, it's done already, as you can see, it turned green. So we didn't do much of a grid search in this case. <coughs> anyway, now it, the, the model is, uh, is trained and in fact this page was updated with the final results. So here it becomes the most crucial part that we can see, okay, did we train any good machine learning models? So in this case we train a, a generalized linear model, a decision tree, a random forest, and a deep learning model. Uh, you can, for example, compare them by accuracy and find out that the random forest was the best. And if you do it by uh, area and the curve, under the curve instead, still the random forest was the best. You can compare the training time. So in the case you have a use case where it takes a long time to train uh, uh, a model, this could be crucial if you're retraining the models every day or every hour, right? So when picking which model you want to use, you might want to take this information into account. Also the prediction time per sample. If you're continuously scoring instances, maybe you would like to know which model is a millisecond faster than another one. And all of this was automatically measured while we were training and scoring those uh, models. So. As you can see, the ROC curve is not that smooth because we didn't have lots of data here, but you can also inspect the uh, more complex views. And if you go to, towards the bottom, you have actually for each model uh, something more complex. For example, the confusion matrix statistics in a bar chart or the cumulative and gain chart and, uh, or a lift chart and, and so on. 
Uh, here is a feature in global feature importance. This was used by training a surrogate random forest model and by extracting the, the, the information from the trees from the number of splits on each instances and we could compute what feature is relevant for the model. And here is just a neat map with the confusion matrix. All right, so um, there is an important part. Okay, let's say that now I want to use the random forest in my business. I want to go and the same day go in production with this model, right? That's the part where we need to see that it's, it's really now a problem that people are discussing it, that it's really hard to go in production once you have this training model. So you can actually, in this case, download the workflow and, and this workflow then you, we can open it in nine real fast and you actually can see that um, this workflow is uh, just, uh, in this case, in a, it's an H2O model and we are, it's an H2O random forest. We are uh, importing the, uh, the parameters and we are applying the feature transformation in the, uh, and the feature uh, preparation and so on. And let me go back to the slides to explain this concept of how is this uh, deployable, right? So you can see that you have then the parameters saved in a table, also the model itself. In this case, it's a logistic regression. You have the predictor to score the instances and you are going to send the new data to be scored here from this component. So uh, if you see here, those are the key parts that you need to adjust to your production environment, right? Could be REST API or could be uh, um, any kind of uh, solution where you maybe you just want to have a, a nice uh, visualization in the end. It's up to you to change this little workflow to make it work for your uh, production. And the uh, end here is uh, all the inside of it. So just a few things. So for example, let's say that your company is dealing with documents, right? And it wants to use this, uh, use this uh, blueprint to classify documents. So what it's going to do is just uh, downloading the workflow and apply some text preprocessing in that part there. And then in that place, you can actually easily uh, uh, have a really custom uh, setup for you. Um, so just some key points here before I wrap up. Automation can take out the drivers, right? But also then it takes away the human expertise and we do not want that. So the idea is to use guided automation to allow the automation of all those boring pieces, but always to keep the expert in the loop, all right? So that's the, the, the message for you tonight, to have a solution for you to uh, make it more uh, easier to automate things. Okay, um, something if you want to use uh, this workflow, you can just go on app.9.com and it's uh, publicly available. Uh, I made this uh, tiny URL for you that maybe it's easier to find, but it's the same to go on app.9.com and then just type in uh, uh, guided automation and then you can find it, download it, play with it, do whatever you want. Or just comment and give really bad feedback at the bottom like, <laughs> if you want. All right, um, thank you. And uh, as there are many other examples like this uh, where you can build other kind of guide analytics application. You can explore the data, you can automatically create visualizations. Uh, you see those applications, they're all really similar. It depends what you want to do with them, right? Um, for example, just select few columns and automatically create all the possible visualizations with it. It's uh, really simple examples, but they can be powerful in certain setups, right? So app.9.com, you can go there and just type in whatever you need and, and see if Nime has it or not. Okay, and some things I need to show you that we have this fall summit in November in Texas. And uh, if you want to come, it's uh, great both for learning how to use NIME and also how to see how other people use NIME in their business, uh, how this helps them. So if you use this code right here, you can get a 10% off and uh, to uh, register for the registration. And uh, uh, something that I would like to leave here for the questions, it's uh, this uh, free token for you. This is a book to see many other uh, use cases that you can use, uh, uh, you can, uh, we, we have at Nine. it's a collection and you can just go on 9.com slash Nine press and you have the free download with this coupon. And thank you. I think that's it. <laughs>